On this night, Samantha is walking alone in the street. Suddenly she notices the cinema billboard is titled The Thing in the Woods, with her name displayed below it. Out of curiosity, she decides to enter and watch the movie. As Samantha sits in a cinema, she watches a terrifying scene where a bloody version of herself is being chased in the woods. Filled with fear, she tries to run away but trips over a dead body, which scares the shit out of her more. Chasing after her is a massive butcher, known as the Welder, who is wearing a metal mask. Fortunately, Samantha's boyfriend, Jason, arrives and pulls her away. They manage to flee from the place before the Welder can reach him. After running for hours, night falls, and they eventually reach the road. They spot a police car approaching, and Jason quickly asks for a ride. A plump police officer steps out and questions why Samantha is covered in blood. Jason explains everything, and after some convincing, the officer agrees to give them a lift. However, before they can leave, the welder appears in front of them. The officer fires shots at the figure, causing him to fall. But as the officer approaches to investigate, he accidentally trips and shoots himself instead, resulting in a fatal injury. The welder regains his footing and resumes chasing after the couple. They keep running until they reach their friend's house. The man is shocked by their condition, and Samantha explains everything that happened. Suddenly, the welder bursts into the room and hurls a hammer, hitting the man and knocking him to the ground. Jason quickly takes action, blocking the door and grabbing a shotgun from the wall for self-defense. The welder tries to break in, but Jason stands his ground. Unfortunately, the welder manages to break through the door and fatally stabs the man. Jason fires a shot, but the welder cunningly uses the man as a shield, escaping unharmed. Tragically, one of the bullets hits the man's head, causing it to burst and blood to splatter everywhere. Then, Jason engages in a fight with the welder, using a knife against him. However, the welder uses it to stab Jason instead and then burn him to death using a flaming tool. Horrified by the gruesome sight, Samantha rushes off to the basement, but much more to her horrors, she discovers mutilated corpses inside. Upon hearing Jason's final steam, Samantha decides to fight back. She emerges from the basement, determined to kill the welder. Surprisingly, she easily overpowers him. Just right when she is about to finish off the welder, his mask comes off. It turns out that the killer is one of Samantha's friends, Fred. Fred urges Samantha to recall their previous week's outing in the woods. Back on that day, the group of friends enjoyed each other's company and had fun, unlike the horrifying situation they find themselves in now. Suddenly, they saw a large object falling from the sky. Jason saw it as an opportunity for adventure and exploration. When they searched for the mysterious object, they found its impact site. When Jason tentatively touches the mass, a swarm of spiders suddenly emerged and chased the group. As a horrid result, the spiders entered their bodies, getting them infected, and started controlling everyone. One by one, everyone except Fred was lucky enough to be able to escape. He managed to reach the cabin, equipped himself with a welding garment, and eliminated his infected friends to stop the spiders from spreading before too late. Samantha finally recalls everything that happened, including how a spider entered her body. However, her skull splits open when she realizes it, and a hidden spider comes off. Fred swiftly kills Samantha. However, when he steps out of the cabin, a swarm of spiders surrounds and possesses him as movement can be seen inside his skull when he drives to the nearby city. The following night, a young couple named David and Anna, they sneak into this empty cinema to be intimate, unknowingly the same one Samantha visited a night ago. Suddenly, the screen lights up, and they find themselves in a movie. Just like they normally would, Anna and David are having a pleasant dinner at a restaurant. Anna always feels frustrated about a scar on her cheek despite David saying he doesn't care. To boost her confidence, David offers to pay for her plastic surgery, citing his mother's extensive cosmetic procedures as normal. The following day, Anna visits the doctor who David introduces. The doctor assures her that the surgery will cover 95% of the scar, and Anna agrees to undergo the procedure willingly. Later, Anna is sedated. However, while under anesthesia, she has a dream. She is happy to walk down the aisle toward David at their wedding. However, upon reaching, she finds the doctor and nurses holding bloody tools, having sly smiles on their faces, which scares her awake. After waking up, Anna requests a mirror from the nurse but gets rejected. She realizes that she might be isolated from the outside world, unable to make phone calls. Suspicious of the situation, Anna decides to investigate and leaves her room. She comes across the nurse's computer and finds disturbing information about the surgery performed on her. Before she can discover more, the nurse returns. Anna decides to escape but hears cries for help from a nearby room. Upon entering, she is horrified to find a woman whose eyes and nose have been surgically removed, making her appear inhuman. Terrified, Anna tries to run away, but the nurse sees her. She fights back, takes down the nurse, and then rushes into an elevator. However, her escape is short-lived as she encounters the doctor waiting for her as the elevator doors open. They overpower her and forcefully sedate her, taking her back to the operating table for another surgery. Later, Anna awakens next to David. 
she takes off the bandages and looks at herself in the mirror, only to be horrified by her drastically altered appearance. Her face is different, with scars and half of her nose missing. She lets out a scream of terror, and at that moment, David's mother enters the room and praises Anna's new look. Anna suddenly finds herself back in the cinema, searching for David. She comes across the projectionist, who tells her that the movie she has been watching reflect her worst fears. On the third night, Father Benedict, a priest from a nearby church, enters upon seeing his name displayed outside the cinema. He's directed to sit down and see a movie about his church. A boy named Peter becomes possessed and climbs up to the roof of the church. He acts strangely and threatens to jump. A nun rushes to him, desperately trying to stop him. She pleads with Peter not to jump and reaches out to hold his hand. Sadly, the evil spirit inside Peter overpowers him and throws him off the roof, causing blood to spray everywhere and shocking everyone. At night, Peter's friend Danny mourns his tragic death while her mother tries to comfort her. Meanwhile, in the church's office, Father Benedict and the nun are doing some forbidden acts of intimacy, breaking the rules of the church. Suddenly, they hear a noise nearby and decide to investigate. To their horror, they find bloodstains scattered all around the church. The following day, Danny is bullied by one of her friends at church, but when she defends herself, the bully is attacked by a mysterious force. As everyone wonders what happened, the girl notices a devil-like creature standing behind Danny's mother. Later that night, all the girls, including Danny, become possessed by an evil spirit. The desperate nun reads a book about the devil and deduces that they are under attack by a devil named Moshit. She rushes to inform Father Benedict about her discovery, but Peter's spirit appears and tells them that the devil is someone they know. The two suspect that the evil spirit has possessed Danny, so they decide to exorcise it before it's too late. However, as they attempt the act, Danny's mother interferes and takes her away. Gradually, Father Benedict realizes that the devil has been residing within Danny's mother all this time. Meanwhile, Danny's mother comes to the girls' living quarters and begins to harm them. Father Benedict and the nun rush to the room but are horrified to see that Danny's mouth is sewn shut. The girls start to attack them, forcing themselves to defend themselves. The duo uses a sword to fight back, but even after killing some of the possessed girls, they come back to life and kill Father Benedict. At the same time, the nun finds Danny's mother going up to the rooftop, intending to kill herself. The nun tries to stop her but is grabbed and held instead. Both of them fall to their death, but the next second, the nun comes back to life, and it's revealed that the evil spirit has now possessed her. Back in reality, Father Benedict sits in the cinema in horror. Suddenly, the projectionist appears behind him and violently strikes him, causing his death. Till now, the cinema has taken three people's lives. Another night, Helen enters the cinema when she's out of the blue. In her movie, she finds herself in a madhouse accompanied by her sons, who constantly mock and belittle her. When she meets with the doctor, she tries to explain her declining mental health and the strange situation around her. But soon, she gets interrupted by an emergency call, and the doctor asks her to return the next day. Feeling reluctant, Helen leaves the room in panics when she finds her sons are missing. She desperately searches for them, seeking help from the staff, but everyone ignores her. Overwhelmed, Helen takes out a pistol from her bag and plans to commit the unthinkable. Just before pulling the trigger, she hears her son's voices and follows. She hears a conversation between the doctors and her boys, where they discuss her mental condition and think it's best she ends her own life. The boys even reveal that they've given her a gun with a single bullet in her back. Helen confronts them, shoots the doctor, takes her sons, and leaves the hospital to go home. Shortly after, Helen comes back to her sense in the cinema. As a result, she also finds the gun in her back. She takes it out, and Helen takes her own life with a gunshot. Another night, a young boy named Riley stumbles upon the cinema and decides to go inside. He has no idea that the horrifying event is awaiting him ahead. He sees himself in a movie where he is portrayed as a famous pianist performing in front of a large crowd. His parents are proud of him. However, their joy soon turns into horror when a stranger emerges from the back seat of their car and holds them at gunpoint. The kidnapper forces Riley's parents out of the car and shoots them when the young boy's father tries to resist. Riley attempts to escape but is also shot in his chest. Riley is sent to the hospital, but when he wakes up, he is traumatized by the fatal event. He asks about his parents' whereabouts, but the doctor avoids answering his questions, which frustrates him more. Strange things keep occurring around Riley while he is in the hospital. He starts seeing a dead man walking around, but all doctors find him crazy. Later, the kidnapper disguises himself as a family member and visits Riley, but a nurse interrupts their interaction. Riley befriends another patient named Casey, who can also see dead people. Riley informs her that he has a vision of his mother urging him to join her in the afterlife, but Casey insists he should be strong and resist. As a result, Riley's mother kills Casey. Later at night, the killer comes back again to take Riley's life, but he manages to escape and hides in a morgue container with Casey's corpse. The boy soon believes he is safe and leaves the morgue, not realizing the killer is still after him. In a crucial moment, Riley has another vision, 
His mother tells him to give up and joins her in the afterlife. But Casey advises him to fight back. Riley finally follows Casey's advice and fatally stabs the kidnapper. As the whole drama comes to an end, Riley is escorted back to his room when the dead kidnapper appears before him again. The horror brings Riley back to reality in the cinema. He sits in fear and sees the projectionist approaching him and warning him to run if he wants to save his life. The old man shows him that all the movie's previous participants are dead, leading Riley to flee at his fastest speed. Riley runs away, but shortly after, the projectionist places his tape on a shelf, indicating that the boy still can't escape from his destined fate. If you like my channel or enjoy watching me dance, please leave a comment in the comment section saying dance, Adam.